if you get up to practice for the marathon and you do this day after day and then suddenly, well, your relationships are suffering because you now focus only on the marathon and nothing else and your health is suffering because your adrenals are all burnt out from overtraining and so then you stop training for the marathon, that's a strategic quit of training. So that's how I differentiate those two. If, you, if the body is telling you to quit versus just this annoying voice in your head. And so I think those who are the serial quitters stop and reevaluate why you quit. Was it because the voice in your head told you to quit? And if it was the voice in your head, because I'm saying if the voice in your head tells you to quit and you ask it, what was it saying at the time? And it's kind of, okay, well, you might get stuck in this thing. And it wasn't anything about the thing. It was just about the fact that you would have to stay with a the thing. Then maybe it's a commitment issue. This is the Anthropology Podcast. The podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As a naturopathic doctor and anthropologist, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Your business, body, balance, and inner badass, these are the themes we are exploring. So I just made this bold assertion. We're talking about business, body, balance, all these hardcore things. We're totally pumped up. But if you're really honest... Have you not had days where you just totally want to quit? You want to sit on the couch instead of seeing your trainer. You want to eat potato chips instead of the salad. And you desperately want to push pause on this entrepreneurial journey. You want some safety and some security, or more importantly, a beach that somebody else could pay for. I've wanted all of these things at different moments of time, but I didn't know what to do about it. And one of the things I struggled with for a very long time is knowing when to actually call it quits. My guest today, Lynn Marie Morsky, says that quitting is in fact her superpower. Her book and business is called Quitting by Design. And what we're going to get into today is when it's actually the right time to call it quits. Lynn Marie Morsky is a medical doctor. She is a lawyer. She is many things. But most excitedly, right now, she is spreading her message to the world about when you need to say it's over for things that are either no longer serving you or you need to acknowledge that they can serve you in a new and evolved way. All of us at some point have had this feeling before, and I'm super excited to dive into a topic that I think is universal for all of us. It is my pleasure to introduce you to my guest today, Lynn Marie Morsky. Lynn Marie Morsky, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to address this topic because it is not something we have talked about before. And especially in the entrepreneurial world, we talk about go, go, go all the time. And today you are going to be talking to us about quitting and quitting by design. I'm deeply curious to know and understand how the heck did you get here in your career? I had done many, many things. I had gone to med school and done the residency and fellowship in sports medicine and realized that wasn't it, you know, my calling. And then I went to law school and I tried the startup life after law school. And then I taught law school. And then one day, I think I was 38. I thought I need to find my calling. I, I want that, that fabled thing you hear about where people enjoy getting up in the morning because they get to go to work. And I was like, I've tried so many things. It's time I focus and figure out what that is for me. I, I don't want to just settle and drift the rest of my life and do whatever work, you know, makes good money, but just isn't fulfilling to me. And so uh, I was listening to a podcast with Seth Godin on Tim Ferriss's podcast. And they said, if you don't know your calling, maybe ask your friends. What do they think? You know, what do they go to you for? And so I did that on Facebook. I put a like I literally put a post like, what do you guys think I should do with my life? I've done all these things. And I was also in politics at the time. And one of my friends said, hey, let's meet and we'll talk about it. And when I was sitting in the car waiting to meet with him, I thought, okay, I've got my journal here. On one piece of paper, I'm going to write what I'm good at. And the other piece of paper, I'm going to write what I like to do. And so with the what I like to do, I put down public speaking and giving advice and some other things. And at the top of the page on what I'm good at, when you, I put pen to paper, I wrote quitting. And that's how it started. And I just thought, okay, I love telling people about quitting. I love strategically quitting things when they're not working for me. And I know it's kind of a pain point in our society, 
maybe I could use my love of public speaking and giving advice to help people quit. And that's, that's the nidus of this whole thing. It's amazing. So what, what is the most powerful thing you've ever quit? Well, I guess the biggest, most impactful on my life was my essentially first career quit because I was a multimedia designer in St. Louis, Missouri. And now I am a doctor lawyer in San Diego. So had I stayed you know, as a multimedia designer, none of these other things, I mean, you can't prove a negative, but it is very unlikely that any of these other things would have happened. Um, but going into med school allowed me to you know, change my whole career trajectory and then it helped me get out of St. Louis. So I moved to the, to the Arizona area, Arizona area. I moved to Arizona, a few different places in Arizona for residency and fellowship. And I think that just was the first thing that set me on the path because there's, there are different mindsets in different places and you have to go, you know, it's, you don't have to, but I had the fortune of being in different places and experiencing those different mindsets that helped me progress and progress to the place I am now. So there's lots of quits that have made an impact, but if you know, you're going to go with like the, you know, the original quit, that one's been pretty important, but like there are many small quits that have made a big difference. Like I quit cooking and for me, you know, <laughs> since you have so to great. eat like three to six times a day, uh, me no longer having to do the cooking of those meals has been huge. I mean, just hugely impactful in my life, taking so much stress off to other people. It's like a thing they wouldn't even consider quitting. But like for me, as a person who was a little bit too into the health and fitness, and I would spend my entire day researching what I should be cooking and then trying to buy the stuff and cook the stuff. And when, there was no time to even eat the stuff. And I was starving by the time I would do it. Forget it. I quit cooking. It's amazing. So my, the, the quits span the range from massive career quits to just like quitting where I get my sustenance. So why are we so scared of it? Like why, why does quitting have such a bad rap because I feel like I watch people and they don't, you know, they don't evolve in their entrepreneurial career. They just collect more businesses and more opportunities. And it's like the, the notion of letting go of something triggers something in the, in the primal brain because people don't like to quit. It's just true. And you asked, it's funny because you asked me a question and then you rephrased it. And they're actually two separate questions. You said, why are we so afraid of quitting? And a lot of the fear comes from the second thing, which is why does it have such a bad rap? But some of the rest of the fear comes from the fact that there, we're always, not always, but very often afraid of the unknown. And there are many unknowns in quitting. Okay, if I quit this job, will the next one be better? Will I find another one? If I quit this relationship or marriage, how, you know, how will my kids do? And will I find love again? I mean, all kinds of unknowns. If I quit, will people think I'm a failure? I don't know. There's an unknown. But the bad rap comes from these ridiculous phrases that we hear that equate quitting with giving up. So when you hear quitters never win and winners never quit, that is literally only applicable in sports. Like if you quit the Boston Marathon, you will not win the Boston Marathon. Accurate. But what they mean to say is that those who give up never win. And that's a very different thing from quitting. And so that's my whole purpose is to destigmatize quitting because like you said when you're talking about entrepreneurs – if you're not quitting, you're barely evolving, right? Because that means you're never shedding your old ideas, your old skin, your old patterns and developing new ones. That's an evolution. But you have to quit those old things. Like you said, if they, you've never quit things, then you're not going to evolve. And I, there are a few of us that want to sit on our deathbed and be like, man, I'm glad I never evolved. But we've found this way to, you, you know, demonize the word quitting, which makes it difficult for people to, to do the quitting that is necessary for their own evolution. Right. Because it's not about the quitting. It's about what the quitting means. It's about what exactly when it the quitting means and what it allows you space to open up to. There's an opportunity cost at, for staying with anything too long. You know, if you're staying in a relationship too long, you probably can't be getting another one or maybe you shouldn't be, you know, um, job. You can probably only have one nine to five. And if you're staying in the wrong one, you're missing out on the opportunity to be in the right one. And so there's lots of aspects about quitting that get overlooked, the, the positives and the reasons that you should want to quit things. And I'm totally cool. If people are more comfortable calling it letting go or transforming or pivoting, you know, big in the entrepreneurial world. Well, pivot just means you quit going one direction and you start going another. Fair enough. I, I heard a speaker uh, while I was in San Diego last week and, and he was just talking about the championship mindset and it was really interesting because he was saying, you know, as humans, we're trying to avoid, uh, we're, we're, we're working towards survival at any given moment. And so the, the survival brain is always like, what will I lose? What will I lose? And he's like, the champion mindset is what will I gain? 
And I feel like that's part of the art of quitting. And you will let me know whether I'm on the right track here, but it's transitioning from this notion of constantly being in a state of what will I lose if I let go of this to what can I, what can I gain if I make room for something else? Yeah. If you're in the, what will I lose mindset? The first quit you need to make is quitting that mindset. And then you can start to make the other quits because a lot of time the quit behind the quit is a mindset quit. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I'm staying in a, in a relationship too long, is it because I'm afraid of leaving the relationship because of what other people would say? At which point you should probably quit basing your decisions on what other people are going to think of them, right? So a lot of it is a mindset quit, but that's a great point that they made is that, you know, you've also probably heard of the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And I think it's the same thing. Like if you have a growth mindset, focus on what quitting will allow you to step into. It's not, somebody said the other day, quitting isn't for me running away from a thing is what can I run toward? Yeah, it is. It is a totally, it may look the same mechanically, but it's actually coming from a completely different place. So how do people actually know when it's time to call something quits? I feel like we've all looked at our, our girlfriends before and been like, oh my gosh, that relationship needs, needs to stop for her. Like we, we see it months or years ahead of where she is at. Do you have, do you have a tool that you give people or mindset that you can help people to achieve, to recognize that when really like, You got to cut your losses here. Yeah, the tool I didn't have to give anybody because we all already have it. It's our intuition. It is the and the thing is, the into as a naturopath, you know this very well. The intuition speaks through the body symptoms, right? So if you're having a racing heart every time you go into a clinic or if every time that you look at your phone when it's ringing and it is boss and your stomach sinks, or if you've got a big meeting the next day at work and you're up all night nervous about it, or just when you're coming home to your significant other and you start to feel like this anxiety building, that's your body telling you something isn't right. We're not talking about the voice in your head. The voice in our head is ne- rarely our best friend. I think most of us spend our lives trying to befriend it and make it nicer to us. But the body is our best friend. And it will tell you, okay, this is out of alignment with your passions, your purpose. This is not in your greatest good. And it can just be, oh, I've started to notice I'm really irritable around this certain person. Or I get like for me, when I I was in a, a startup that wasn't working, every time I would see that there was an email from the startup, I would go from totally normal to like this feeling in the pit of my stomach. And I was like, what can take me from normal to pit of my stomach? Oh, it's clearly the startup. Like that's how you know. That's how like in the strategic quitting process I talk about, you know, step one is figuring out if there's something you need to quit. And that's how you start to to, her- to narrow in on whether there is, is that, okay, do I have symptoms that are coming seemingly out of nowhere? But think about how many things, how many medical conditions are stress-based. Right. Migraines, chronic pain, insomnia, everything, high blood pressure, GERD. Yeah. Short of like breaking a muscle or sorry, breaking, breaking a muscle, breaking a bone or tearing a muscle. So short of some kind of musculoskeletal thing that's an actual injury. Most things probably have a nidus somewhere in in stress, even chronic like, oh, I've got chronic back pain. For me, whenever I have back pain and it comes out of nowhere, it's almost always a relationship problem. And I've been able to look back at patterns and I know other people that like uh, a friend of mine was a trainer and she said this other trainer in my studio, every time that she would have a breakup, she would come in and she just would like have these flu like symptoms, you know, like even these crazy symptoms that we would think never came from stress. There's, you know, stress can have strange effects on our immune system and interesting things can happen. So if you're like, okay, every time I do this thing, my body reacts in this way, well then start paying attention the next time your body acts in that way and don't just treat the symptoms take a step back and say, what is causing this? And is it a thing that I can let go of? Absolutely. The body's so much more intelligent than we give it, uh, than we give it credit for. So, So if step one is tapping into that intuition and that feeling and, and frankly, acknowledging that it's there, because I think we all get really good at, at denying it, uh, for a period of time, what do we do next? The second step is narrowing down exactly what needs to be quit because we may be like, okay, I realize I've got insomnia. I've got anxiety. It's something needs to go. But think about if it's a work quit, work quits are not easy if you're trying to quit the entire career or your entire job. But it may not be that those whole things have to go. 
imagine if it's just the commute that's giving you stress. Okay, every time I get in the car, my heart rate is through the roof. My blood pressure starts to soar. I'm irritable. I'm like, hey, this rush hour traffic. But when I get to work, things are fine. And then when I get back home, oh my gosh, the, this rush hour again. If the only problem is the rush hour, then just go and ask if you can quit your commute. Okay, can I work from home? If you're in that kind of situation where it's not like a patient care one-on-one -on -one thing, can I do, or even if it is, can I do telemedicine? Like, you quit only what is causing the problem. Quitting isn't easy. You don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater and quit more than you need to. And also, you don't want to quit the wrong thing. Like I was in a, my own personal situation. I was currently, or at the time, I was working at the VA, and I was also in a startup. And I started having anxiety, and I was having insomnia. And I thought it was the VA, even though I'd had the VA job for years, but the startup was new and sexy, and I was like, it can't be the startup. So I almost quit the VA thinking, this is you know killing my health. And what I did instead was I did a mini quit and I just took a month off of the VA, at which point my symptoms did not go away. And I was like, oh, it's not the VA. It's the startup. And it was in that time when I realized, oh, every time I get an email from the startup, my stomach sinks. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I almost quit the wrong thing. Like, you don't want to you don't want to quit your marriage when it's your job that's wrong. Right. So step two is narrowing in on what exactly is causing the friction. Like once you realize, OK, there's friction, let's figure out exactly what it is so that we quit the right thing and no more. And then from there, step three is like overcoming fears related to the quit. Step four is preparing logistics for the quit. And step five is how to make the quit in the way that burns the fewest bridges and preserves relationships as best as possible. Okay, let's skip to step five. <laughs> it's the fun one. <laughs> right. So I, I think that's a huge, I think that's a huge fear for lots of people. And, and I, I, I have observed that all of the fears and language around quitting all go into step five, which is they're not going to like me anymore. I'll never get a job anymore. And I categorize all of those things into the box of limiting beliefs. But regardless, they're very real for that person. So like, what can we do to mitigate that? Because sometimes just having a plan around mitigation is, is sort of physiologically decompensating for people. We get We move into a safer space. Yeah, absolutely. Tim, Tim Ferriss's book, I think it's uh, Tools of Titans, talks about fear setting, which I think is exactly what you're talking about, mitigation of the these possible bad outcomes. And if you're talking about specifically, let's say a job quit, and they're really afraid that, okay, if I quit the job, they're going to be angry at me. If they are, what happens? Right? Okay, then what's the worst possible thing that could happen from there? So that's that's essentially the fear setting process. And then you realize, okay, once I've looked at the worst possible thing that can happen, how would I deal with it? Right. So let's take that scenario. You go into your your boss and they are upset with your quit. Well, this is why the strategic quitting process is important because it's going to teach you how best to frame your quit so that it is most likely that they will not be upset. And this is what that looks like. It's the same with a breakup. You go in and you say, It's not you, it's me. If you're working at a hospital, it is not working for you. Okay. You don't go in and say, dear hospital, uh, I don't like the administration. I don't like the patients. I don't like my boss. I hate my schedule. Everything about this job is the worst. Yes, they are going to be angry with you. Or if you just go in and say, I'm quitting, they may be a little confused and not that excited. But if you go in and say, I have loved my time working in this hospital. I've learned so much here. But my entrepreneurial spirit is kicking in and I am just going to kick myself 40 years down the road if I never go try my hand at this thing I've wanted to do, this creative side gig, whatever it is. Then it's nothing bad about them. It is just that you have another passion. And the other thing about doing these quits is that do it at a time, if you can withstand for long enough to this, for this to happen, do it at a time that is not going to negatively impact other people. Like if somebody's on maternity leave and you can wait until they're back from maternity leave so then suddenly there aren't two people out, then that's going to leave them with a better taste in their mouth than when you're, you know, leave people high and dry. So if you take it, you go in there and you're trying to quit at a, a key time that's best for everybody and you make it about you and not them, they have no reason to be angry with you. If they, and this is the thing, if they care about you as a human, they will understand. If they do not care about you as a human, you did not want them as your employer in the first place. And it does not matter if they are angry and that everybody sits down like, but they're the ones who it's that, you know, people are going to call for my next job. And this is again, this limiting belief you're talking about. If you go to the next job and they call your boss and your boss somehow bad mouths you for quitting, which by the way, like, that's what we all imagine would happen. But most people aren't inherently evil. Like they would have to say, if you, if you went there and said, 
I tried to quit at the best time possible. I just really have to do this other thing. And they still badmouth you in your next, you know, in the in the referral call or whatever. And the future employer takes that against you, then that's not your employer either. Right. If you go to, you know, employer number two and say, this is why I quit my last job. It seemed like they may have been a little upset about it, but I tried to tell them like it wasn't them. It was, I really need to try this new thing. Then, you know, this it's a process of finding people who are your people and whoever is going to be angry with you. They're not your people. If you go to them with the heartfelt reason that is you centered of why you have to quit. Well, and I'm going to just say one little thing in there for all the Canadians who are are listening, which is like 50% of our audience. It's not even legal in Canada to accept, um, you, you cannot at, take calls from new employers related to previous employers and say anything but positive things. So you can decline to comment on an employee. But you you can't you can't badmouth them. You're not allowed to. I feel like that's like the ultimate Canadian rule. Um, wow! But you can't. So you can. <laughs> that's you can, amazing. I know it's cool, right? Uh, so you can dec- you can decline um, to speak regarding that uh, that employee, but you you can't say anything. So like we've just we've just destroyed that limiting. But like quit away, everyone. I love that Canada is down with the quit. That's amazing because you're right. That is a big fear that people have, and Canada's like, yeah, we got we got your back. That's great. <laughs> Yay, Canada. It's kind of awesome. There was a speaker this weekend at um, an event I was at, and she was uh, she was talking about just like how to gain control over your emotions. But she was talking about limiting beliefs. And she's like, behind all the limiting beliefs is things like, you know, I'm, I'm scared about what they're going to think. I'm scared about this. She's like, behind it are the emotions you're worried you're going to experience as a result of that action. And uh, it was really interesting where she's like, no matter what action you want to take in your life, if you understand the emotion behind that action that you're actually scared of confronting, it, it makes moving into that space or into that decision uh, so much easier. And I, I found that I just felt like that advice unlocked a whole layer of why people don't take action. It was super interesting. It makes sense. Yeah, but it was interesting. Yeah. And that's why step three is overcoming fears, because if you're afraid of quitting, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, just don't be afraid of quitting. Nah, that's not going to help you. You can only overcome the fears that you've identified. And so step three is like, what am I afraid of? Am I afraid of what other people will think? Am I afraid of being thought of as a failure? Am I afraid of the time or money I quote unquote wasted in that job or relationship or um, getting training for that career? Um, those are the kinds of fears that are, oh, and then the, that whole, I don't, the fear of, will there be another thing next? Like if you're afraid of quitting, Try to pinpoint which of those fears is the one stopping you because there are ways that I can logic you through all of those different quits uh, or different fears, but you have to figure out which one is is standing in your way. Well, I want to talk about one you just brought up there, which is the sunk cost fallacy of quitting, where people don't want to leave something they're not enjoying, whether it's a comedy show or a movie or an event or a vacation, because they're like, I already paid for it. So I might as well stay at this shitty three-star hotel for the next six days (laughs) because it's paid for. Like, it, it just, can we shine some light on that logic? Uh, absolutely. Let's, let's shine light with sushi. Great. So if you right, let's do this. So you've gone to a sushi restaurant and you got fifty dollars worth of sushi. And I use sushi because you are not going to take that home and reheat it. Please do not do that. So essentially, your sushi is going to be eaten right there or not at all. And you get halfway through the sushi that you've already spent fifty dollars for, right? And you're so stuffed. And you think, do I leave the rest of the sushi or do I keep eating just because I spent the fifty dollars, right? So if you keep eating, you still have spent fifty dollars. If you stop eating, you have spent $50. Like when you keep eating, you don't get the money back. Right? And what happens instead is, well, then you have to spend more money probably because then you have to go buy some Rolaids or Tums for the, the you know, distress you have caused yourself gastrointestinally. And you probably lose another hour of your life. And if time is money, then you've cost yourself more there because you have to now go to the gym and be on the treadmill for an extra hour. If, if that's a thing that you do, like, you know, okay, I've eaten this much. I'm going to go to this much gym or it maybe just because you're going to feel so bad about having gorged yourself. I'm going to hit the treadmill for another hour. And then maybe you're like so comatose from a food coma for the rest of the night that you couldn't do all the productive things that you were going to do. So you have lost more more money by trying to by, by not even trying to save yourself money by just trying to like make the $50 worth it it doesn't make any sense in that food situation and then just apply it to life but then i think what a lot of people misunderstand is what their goal is in what in whatever they had invested the time and money in so let me give you an example if they're in a relationship and you it's not going well. You've done all the counseling and you're the thing standing between you and, and quitting is like, but I've already been with this person for three years. 
That means you've get, you've invested three years in finding a lifelong partner. You did not invest three years to be with that person, right? Like when you get into a relationship, it's probably because you want to find a lifelong partner. I'm just generalizing for the, you know, monogamy community here, but it's not because, oh, I spent three years trying to make this person my spouse. I've spent three years trying to get closer to a life partner. If this person is not going to get me closer to a life partner, because clearly it's not working, then I have, I owe it to myself for for the time I have invested to keep looking. Like you can't see this investment. Think Think of it as an investment and not just something that you have spent. Like I spent a quarter million dollars of somebody else's money that I still have to pay back because this is America. And we have to pay things back in Canada too. Do you have to pay, but you, you don't have free college up there either. I, I know there's good health care, but I didn't know what the college situation was. Yeah, you got to pay that back too. Got to pay college back. Okay. All right. So yeah, so you're all with me that if you went to med school like me, you may have this quarter million dollars of somebody else's money to pay back. And I've got 10 years invested in what I thought when I got into it was I'm investing this in becoming a sports medicine doctor. But when I got to sports medicine and realized it was not for me, I realized I wasn't investing that time and money in becoming a sports medicine doctor. I was investing that time and money in finding a career I thought would be fulfilling. And the fact that I've already donated so much of my life to this, dedicated so much of my life, and it wasn't the end-all, be-all career I thought it was, means I owe it to myself to keep finding because I have already spent so much time and money It would be a disservice to that time and money to just stick around and be like, well, because I spent that, I got to stay here. No, I was trying to find a happy career. I need to keep looking. I love that you that you did that. And and I can totally appreciate that you probably got some pushback on it um, because my husband went to medicine and did his residency. And then was like, "Mm, I'm not really sure this is what I want to be doing. And people don't understand it. They just don't understand the pursuit of happiness and fulfillment um, at the expense of all of these other pieces. And I love what you said there where it was, re- it's really about the goal and people don't understand what the goal is of any given situation. They just seem to be able to look at the balance sheet. Exactly. And, and there's so many old mindsets that luckily this new generation, new generation is shedding, but yeah, quitting medicine is a rough one because once you get there, I mean, like I said, with the quarter million dollars, it, you can't just walk away. Like even if I filed for bankruptcy, that would still be there. And so now I, you know, it gets you kind of trapped in a thing where, oh my gosh, well, I have to almost keep practicing medicine or do something that still makes a decent salary because I still have these loans. And so that's why I think a lot of people start to get in the, the system. And then once they've got, you know, family and kids and they have more payments, it's like, well, medicine still makes the most money. But man, if you could stop before all those things get in place and realize this isn't working for me and without any guilt, because nobody who's about to go into medicine knows exactly what it's going to be like. Nobody. You can shadow all you want, but until that person is dying at your hands or until they are paging you at four in the morning for some opioids, you will not know. And so do not feel guilty about wanting to change your or about having changed your mind and wanting to do a different thing because the person who made that decision is not the person you are now. The person you are now has more knowledge and a whole different maybe set of values and beliefs. I mean, medicine is such a long road. Like I said, for me, 10 years, who was I 10 years ago? Or well, at this point, it was, you know, 15 something years ago, but I was a totally different person. And so I I don't ever blame that person for the decisions they made. And nobody else, I think, should either. No, I love that. And I think focusing on the goal, and I've been really open about this. And I, when I speak to students or or people in, in my profession as a naturopathic doctor, I say, I am more committed to the way of thinking that surrounds naturopathic medicine and how I believe that that can contribute to the world than I am to keeping my title and a practice and all the traditional ways in which that typically plays out. So I don't know what that's going to mean yet for my career, but it never even occurred to me to think of at some point no longer being in practice as quitting practice. I always just view it as an evolution of my commitment to a way of thinking um, and pursuing the power of this this system of medicine in a variety of different fields, one of which is entrepreneurship. So it's interesting the mindset piece that um, that one brings to it as well. Yeah, for sure. And, and like you're talking about with healthcare providers, there's this extra societal pressure because if we want to quit, society thinks first off that they know why we went into medicine. Oh, didn't you go in because you wanted to help people? And then if you want to quit oh, are you spawn of Satan because you no longer want to help people? Like this is the, the, the thoughts that people have. And like exactly what you just said is the same thing I felt in my own life. Yeah, in sports medicine, I could technically help people. Generally, they were really high maintenance athletes that 
didn't necessarily need whatever help I was giving them. Like, oh, here, I have a flu shot or something, you know, something that was not making a big, somebody else will do it, right? But I am still helping people in a totally different way and impacting way more people than I ever could have when I was doing sports medicine and in a way that not anybody could have. You know, it takes somebody whose superpower is quitting as mine is to feel as though, okay, let me step up and help spread this power to other people. So I am still helping people. It's not like suddenly I don't want to help people anymore. If, if the practice of clinical medicine, like you said, in, in the traditional sense isn't working for you, it's just that that way of helping people may not be your way. Yeah. And it's, it's actually really refreshing to, uh, to explore this idea. I'm, I'm kind of loving this whole conversation and I want to, I want to interrupt another limiting belief that I think is probably out there, which is the people who are listening to this conversation going, this is amazing. I am a serial quitter. I've quit everything I've ever done in my life. And I think at the opposite end of quitting, there's, you know, I think we're talking about strategic quitting. And I think at the other side, there's just people who, who can't commit, can you differentiate for us so that those people can have a, a quick call to attention the difference between a fear of commitment and an ability to quit strategically? I love the way you phrase that. I'm not sure I've ever been asked that. So I'm going to I'm, I'm going to get to think about that even more after we get off this call. So I love that the fear of commitment. But what I generally say if you're trying to decide whether your quit is a strategic and necessary one or if you're more in the giving up. And so giving up and fear of commitment aren't the exact same. So I'm going to tell you that one first and then see if we can extrapolate it over to the, the commitment fear. But when we were talking your the voice in your head versus your body, that's how I differentiate between quitting and giving up. If you get up to run uh, in the morning because you're preparing for a marathon – and your head says, oh, but it's toasty in this bed and oh, it's cold outside. and I don't want to run. And so you stop training for a marathon. That's giving up. If you get up to practice for the marathon and you do this day after day and then suddenly, well, your relationships are suffering because you now focus only on the marathon and nothing else. And your health is suffering because your adrenals are all burnt out from overtraining. And so then you stop training for the marathon. That's a strategic quit of training. So that's how I differentiate those two. If, you, if the body is telling you to quit versus just this annoying voice in your head. And so I think those who are the serial quitters stop and reevaluate why you quit. Was it because the voice in your head told you to quit? And if it was the voice in your head, because I'm saying if they're, well, if the voice in your head tells you to quit and you ask it, what was it saying at the time? And it's kind of, okay, well, you might get stuck in this thing. And it wasn't anything about the thing it was just about the fact that you would have to stay with a the thing, then maybe it's a commitment issue. And then likewise, if you have body symptoms that are telling you to quit, like we were talking about before, take a look at what's causing that symptom. Is it because there's something wrong with the situation you're in? Or do you get those body symptoms every time you commit to any situation? So like, okay, is it every time I get a new relationship, I start having anxiety? Is it every time I get into a new job? And then you realize, okay, it may just be the, the committing that's my issue. And we don't, like you said, want to have a life where we never can commit to anything. So that's where, you know, maybe get yourself a good therapist and dive into that issue and see if you can address that. But still, your intuition is your best friend at pointing out like, okay, every time I do this thing, I have the symptom. And if that thing is the committing that causes the symptoms, then that I think should give you a better idea. And just to differentiate and point out for people, your intuition is never going to tell you to sit on the couch with a bag of potato chips for weeks on end. That is like a different physiological override. Um, and I've seen those people who are like, oh, you know what? I just like, I just, I just feel like I should, I just need to sleep more. And I just need to like the people who are checking out of life. That's probably not, that's probably not your intuition. Um, and your advice of getting someone to help you really like hone in on what your goals are, I think is, is super key. You mentioned something earlier, Lynn Marie, that I thought was so interesting. And you said it sort of in passing, um, but I just wanted to unpack it a little bit. You said, oh, if that happened, I would just do a, a mini quit. And then I'd come back and reevaluate what's going on. What's a mini quit? <laughs> sounds delightful. Mini, isn't it? It's so cute. Oh, a mini quit is essentially a break from whatever you're doing. If I want to figure out if my job is the, the problem, ask if you, luckily I make my own schedule. And so I went in and I said, I just need a month off. I didn't get paid for that month. You know, I only get paid if I go in, but I said, I need a month off. And that was essentially like a trial quit, a mini quit, a trial quit, same thing. It's like, let's test out the quit. It's, it's not applicable in all situations, you know, but a lot of situations you can take, even if you're in your relationship, say, Hey, 
I don't, I'm, I'm having some angst, some friction feelings. I don't know if it's this relationship. Can we take a few weeks apart? And hopefully the other person is understanding. And if they're not, again, we get to decide who our people are and who our people are not, right? So that may tell you, nope, this person, this relationship may be the problem because the person wasn't even willing to give me a few weeks space to figure my things out. So a mini quit is just either when you've done that kind of thing where I can step away from something for a while or uh, there's an analog here, which is the mental quit. And if you picture quitting a thing and you feel amazing, that may be a great indicator that that thing is not working for you. Whereas if you picture quitting a thing and you're like, oh my gosh, but I'm going to miss this and this and this and this and this, and you suddenly feel like, oh, I want that thing back. Well, then that is a really easy way to tell whether you should quit something be- without having any sequelae, right? You just quit in your head. This is just like, because you know that your brain reacts to your thoughts as if they're happening, right? Like if I picture falling off of a cliff, my heart rate's going to be through the roof, even if I'm just sitting here on my couch, right? So imagine that you're actually quitting. Tell your brain you're actually quitting and see if you're flooded with dopamine or if you're suddenly like in a panic. Yeah, it's such great advice. And as you're listening to this, I was like, I've quit some big things in my life. And um, and it was actually the most amazing thing I'd ever done. I quit a business that I was in and I like I moved on from it. And I can go back and visit that clinic now and, and visit my past business partner and not, not feel anything. I don't have any remorse. I don't like, it really was, it was amazing. Um, and I've quit a few other things along the way where it just fine. Exactly what you said. I followed that intuition where I was like, Oh, every time I get an email related to this, it's just, I can feel it through my whole system and I let it go. And it's has continued to serve me, but I don't have to serve it. Um, and this whole process, um, and what you're talking about, I think is so powerful for people because you're putting language to something that I think people either are doing or they don't know how to do. Yeah. And, and you can only get better at a thing, you know, we can improve what we can quantify, right. And what we can look back on. And, and if your fears around quitting are okay, this specific thing, then look back. Okay. When have I done that specific type of quit before? And you probably have, but like you said, most of us don't sit there and call them quits. And I think calling them quits, calling it quits, um, has two benefits. One is you can look back and say, Oh, I've done it before. I've survived that one. I can survive this one. But also there's an energy that's different behind saying I'm quitting a thing that I think helps it stick with you more. For example, I have said I am quitting staying at people's houses that I've never been to before, which is a really randomish quit. But it seems like in the past year I've been traveling a bunch and I would stay. Somebody's like, hey, you can come stay with me. And I've never been to their house. This this led to a situation in France where I was supposed to carry an 80 pound suitcase up seven flights of a sterile uh, spiral staircase because I didn't know that she lived on the seventh floor. No elevator. We couldn't get the suitcase up. It was a disaster. And I thought, OK, I have enough you know, funds to not have to just stay on somebody's couch. I am never I'm quitting staying at other places that I don't know of. And if I hadn't said that so specifically, I think I would forget about it later. And then somebody's like, hey, you want to stay at my place? And I'd be like, sure. But I think once you put the energy behind quitting things, it's, it helps you later in life not repeat the same mistakes. Totally. And it gives and it gives you rules of engagement and boundaries before you're in that situation. Yes. Oh, yes. I love that. I love that phrasing. Hey, fellow go-getters. So we've got a lot going on right now over at Anthropology Performance Labs, and I want to make sure that you guys are in the loop. We have groups and contests and quizzes and meal plans and all sorts of things that you can get your hands on. And the best place for you to be in the know is actually to ensure that you are following and hanging out and engaging over on the gram. My personal handle, which is at doctor, that is D-R Megan Walker, is where most of this activity is currently taking place. And so I'm going to invite all of you to come on over and to follow and to play along. This way you can engage with our weekly guests, get direct links to some of the things that they're talking about in our show notes, and have access to some of the coolest new quizzes, ideas, and games and links that we have have in the pipeline over at Anthropology. Head on over to Instagram, hit follow, and let's keep in touch. My handle over there is at Dr. Megan Walker, and let's keep the conversation happening. This is so exciting, and I feel like we could we could jam out on this uh, 
all day long. Um, but Linry, what I would really love to do is transition the nature of the conversation and really learn a little bit more about you. And I call the second portion of the interview our KPIs. So just like we have them in business, I think we have key performance indicators with respect to how we live our own lives. So I've got six or seven rapid fire questions for you if you are down with that. I'm down. Amazing. Because I always ask people and I don't know what I would do if they said no. But so thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, has anybody ever said no? <laughs> no, but like, do I, it would have been great if button? you're like, I quit. <laughs> I, I'm quitting your KPIs. This is what <laughs> Okay, this is awkward. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, who is inspiring you right now? Tulsi Gabbard. Oh, tell me more. She is one of the now comically like 1700 uh, women running for president. <laughs> but before she decided to run for president, she was always an inspiration to me. She's a, a congresswoman from Hawaii. She was, I, she's in the, the armed services somehow. I don't know which branch she's in, but she's also a capoeirista. I used to train capoeira. It's a Brazilian martial art. And on top of all of her just general badassness, when I met her in person, she was as legit a person and humble and very cool. And she insta-stalked me, which is an added bonus of, of like flattery. And I like, there's so many great things about her. She's she, like you'll follow her Instagram and not only is she running for president, but then like her husband will shoot a video of her just like walking to the airport singing Bob Marley. And then the two of them like do a duet. Like she's just oozing with talent, but also with composure and with actual knowledge and experience and badassery. And she's just all the things oh, she inspires. me. I love it. What is your audacious goal for the next year? Well, you know, let's go with this one to have a TEDx talk. Hmm, I think you'd be amazing. What is the one thing you are most consistent with, with respect to your health? Oh, working out. I love working out. It's, it happens like it's, if I miss two days of working out, something has gone terribly wrong. Like it's been my thing since I was in grade school, not necessarily always to the healthiest levels, a little orthorexia probably here and there, but I just love the high you get from it and the good feeling. And, and it's, it's that kind of okay, I'm still doing all right. Even if I've picked out all day on some weird foods, like I've had that one thing. I've, I've added many more like breath work. I'm pretty consistent with at this point and, and some other health practices, but like lifelong working out is my jam. Amazing. What is something totally badass about you that people would not otherwise know? This requires me to like call myself totally badass in any aspect. So that's, um, bit awkward for me. But uh, I do have if you go to quitting by design, the YouTube channel, there's a playlist of things that are not quitting related. And it's me playing the guitar or the electric bass and singing in either English or Portuguese. And I don't think most people know that that exists. So whether or not it's totally badass, it's maybe the Oh, and I also currently have a big fascination with going across the street to this karaoke bar I live next to and doing uh, Guns N' Roses or Bon Jovi. That's very totally loudly. badass. And yeah, that's my jam. <laughs> yeah, it's totally badass. Um, you maybe already answered this, but what do you do for fun or play? I karaoke a lot. Uh, that's that's my current thing because because I, it takes nobody else to do it, right? I can just by myself go over to karaoke, sing, leave. You know, it, no, it doesn't require any other partners or a big space to do it. But I'm a lifelong dancer, so a really good paired up partner to salsa dance with and then we hit the floor to a song i really love that's a total flow state for me so dancing and singing and playing music those are my ways i have fun so great it's a skill i wish singing is a skill i wish well dancing too is a few <laughs> skills i wish i totally i totally had so i i'm always i'm always envious when people um when that's what they're doing for fun or play well, let me just tell you, I was not, there's like documented evidence in my childhood that I was not a singer. Like it was written in the newspaper because I was in musical theater and my mom had actually said, well, she's not a good singer. So like I was a terrible singer at some point, but in Capoeira, you have to sing at the top of your lungs for like hours at a time. And I think after seven years of doing that, all of a sudden I just had a voice. Oh, that's so amazing. Never too late. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. My martial art of choice right now is Kung Fu, but I feel like these things evolve. Yeah. What is your favorite color? Indigo. Hmm. I need to start to keep a poll on these answers because indigo <sighs> comes up a lot. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, so interesting. Right? And there's always like an, there's always this really cool, like energetic feel to people when indigo comes up. Anyway, 
are they all Virgos? Because I know I'm not like really into that, but I once read something that said, Virgos, your favorite color is blue. And I was like, but it is. Like, how did that? I didn't know. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. I'm going to start to keep an unofficial set of data points around this. Last question for you, Lynn Marie. Entrepreneurism, are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? I think you're not born this way because I am entrepreneuring currently and I definitely never was born this way. I never wanted to entrepreneur, but I think many of us get to the same realization at some point in life where we do not want somebody else's decision to affect our livelihood and our passion, our you know ability to walk day to day doing the things that we like. And until you work for yourself, it is hard to make that claim. There's generally always somebody that can pull the plug you know, right now I could lose my job at the VA if my boss pulled the plug. And that is a precarious position to be in, a position that most of the society is in all the time, though. So we're kind of just found it normal. But I would like to erase all points of anxiety from my life. And the fact that somebody could pull the plug from me is a point of anxiety. And so I think that leads me to try to build my entrepreneurial muscle so that I could be in a position where I'm, the you know, as long as I'm doing the work, I'm going to be okay. Lynn Marie Morsky, you have been a fascinating guest and you're on such an important mission. Where can people find out more about what you're up to? Well, I really appreciate you having me on. This was a delightful discussion. Uh, if you want to listen to my podcast, it is called Quit Happens. You can find it on all the podcast locations. And you can find me at Quitting by Design on Facebook and Instagram, Quit Happens on Twitter. I have a Facebook group called Quitopia your humble home on the web for all things strategic quitting. And uh, if you want coaching, I have one on one or I have an online course and all of those, including my book called Quitting by Design, all of that can be found at my website, quittingbydesign.com. Awesome. All things quitting will be hooked up in our show notes. Thanks so much for hanging out today. Thank you so much for having me. This is delightful. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world.